Good evening. I'm Marielle Villaray, Program Development Director of the Office of Academic Initiatives and Strategic Innovation, and as part of that role, also Director of LP Squared, the Lifelong Learning Program at the Graduate Center. I'm really proud to introduce this first event of a new lecture series called Unmasking Bias, organized by the LP Squared Diversity Committee. LP Squared is a non-credit program grounded by study groups that are peer organized, complemented by several member-led committees and activities, including public lectures like this one, among other community events and volunteer-driven initiatives. I want to thank the Diversity Committee for their planning efforts on this series and the IER, Institute for Education and Retirement, for their support. If you're retired or partially retired and interested in getting more information about the program, please visit www.gc.cuny.edu slash LP2. We'll get started with our pan panel momentarily. Following the panel discussion, I will moderate a Q&A. You can submit your questions at any time throughout the program with the Q&A button at the bottom register of your Zoom window. Just type in your questions there. Following the program, you'll receive a survey that we hope you'll complete along with more information about LP Squared and resources related to tonight's talk on how to get involved. I'm now going to welcome the Diversity Committee member and organizer of tonight's event, Phyllis Holloway, to turn on her camera and microphone to introduce tonight's panel. Thank you, Marielle. LP Squared at the Graduate Center CUNY began the diversity, equity, and inclusion workshops this spring with great success. The Diversity Committee is presenting our first speaker from the speaker series, Unmasking Bias. We would like to present Michelle Fine, a distinguished professor of critical psychology, women's studies, social welfare, American studies, and urban education at the Graduate Center. She is a founding faculty member of the Public Science Project in collaboration with movements from racial and educational justice. She is recognized as a professor extraordinaris at the University of South Africa. UNISA Psychology Department 2021 through 2024. As a scholar expert in litigation, a teacher and educational activist, her work center theoretically and epistemic epistemically on questions of justice and dignity, privilege and oppression, and how solidarities emerge. She has a rich international network of collaborators and activist scholar colleagues. She is also author, co-author, editor and co-editor of more than 20 books. I would like to present Dr. Michelle Fine. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm really honored um, to be invited as the first speaker in the LP Squared Network. Um, I'm a faculty member at the Graduate Center and all those programs that Phyllis named. I'm, I'm also recently appointed to the University of South Africa, um, about which I'm, I'm quite honored. Um, and when I was asked to give this talk on um, unmasking bias, I guess we named this before we knew that COVID and masking would be a very political issue. Um, I thought what, what better community um, than this one to bring my colleagues and friends who are researchers with me, but also friends and colleagues and activists and uh, women I rely on um, to build visions of what could be um, and to help build movements based in research, particularly led by the wisdom of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women. So this evening uh, with my friends, Judith Clark, Kathy Bodine and Cheryl Wilkins, if she can get on the screen, I think she's caught in traffic. Um, we're going to be um, unpacking stories of the power and pain of leadership of women behind bars 
and women who were um, more recently um, released from prison. The movements that they have fronted, the movements that they have activated, and we invite all 123 of you to get active in these movements. So before I begin my talk, let me turn to uh, Judith Clark to introduce herself. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I love the City University and the Graduate Center, so it feels like an honor to be here. Um, I'm Judith Clark. Um, I, uh, as, as, the, the, as the, the flyer that you all saw says, I fairly recently um, out of uh, prison after doing 38 years. It's actually now not quite as recent. It's, I got out um, two and a half years ago. Um, and I currently work with an organization called Our Children, um, which runs um, programs, mother-child programs in the prison where I was in Bedford. Um, and on the outside, uh, they provide housing and services to women emerging from incarceration. And when I got out, I, um, I, I felt the need to have work that reconnected me to the community that I had been part of while I was inside. I also am active um, along with actually both Michelle and Kathy and um, um, in, a, um, in something that's called the Survivors Justice Project, which is um, trying to bring together a diverse grouping of people to, um, to promote the use of a law that got passed um, after much struggle on the part of formerly incarcerated and incarcerated women um, called the Domestic Violence Survivors um, Act, which is, uh, which is we're trying to make it to be able to be used to lessen women's um, sentences who are in and to lessen the sentences of women facing charges that are connected to their own experience of domestic violence. Um, and I'm active in a number of different efforts, which I'll talk about um, to, to address the problems of mass incarceration and uh, that are really serious. And I'm sure most of you know that um, in this, the greatest, largest, richest city, as they like to talk about, um, we have a island of thousands of prisoners, Rikers Island, where the 13th person just died in the last year um, of COVID um, and neglect. So thank you, Judy. Yeah. So we'll we'll unpack the Survivors Justice Project and some of the other projects we've worked on together. Let's just get Kathy in here. Kathy. Hey, great. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> and uh, wow, I feel like I'm here with old friends and colleagues and uh, family, I guess you'd have to say. <laughs> so I, uh, I did 22 years at, uh, in, in prison and um, at also at Bedford Hills, uh, where I was with Judy. And uh, here we are here, but we did a tremendous amount of work together when we were in prison and are working together now. Well, we aren't, we are, we aren't. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say about that. But anyway, we're not allowed to see each other except on Zoom, so. We're allowed, to, we're allowed to, it's acknowledged that we both do similar work. Okay. <laughs> Overlapping. Um, <laughs> but I've been home for 17 years. And uh, when I first came home, I definitely felt a desire to be connected to a life that I had been leading for so many years and did so in a couple of ways. One was I, I had a job, part-time job at, a, at what was then St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital. And we, with the, with the whole group of women that I had been in prison with, and we had done work around AIDS, we created an organization um, that was, we created a program called the Coming Home Program for, that would address and really encourage people coming home from prison to be able to get health care and educated the staff, the doctors, the nurses, the telephone operators, everybody about to, to, to think about the whole issues of people coming home from prison as part of a, 
a, a growing social need and movement. And I also did a doctoral degree at Teachers College that was looking at the experience of um, adolescents who had had incarcerated mothers and whose mothers were almost all still in prison. And I think those two projects helped me feel a lot of continuity with the people that I'd been in prison with, with their kids, with whom I had worked inside with parenting programs. And uh, I guess the other main thing I wanted to do when I came home was to address the issue of people in prison with violent crimes. And we say violent crime and then sort of the person disappears. And that's precisely what's happened in sort of criminal justice reform movements. And so both uh, around trying to build consciousness about the long sentences and the parole denials that people with quote, uh, a violent act were being kept in prison, um, as well as figuring out what, what does accountability mean other than just punishment, punishment, punishment. And we created an organization called RAP, Release Aging People in Prison, that's now part of a larger parole justice campaign, and we can talk about that. Um, ultimately, about, I don't know, 12 years ago, Cheryl Wilkins and I created something called the Center for Justice at Columbia University. And the purpose of that was to imagine an entire university getting engaged in the issue of mass incarceration. And that was really before that term mass incarceration was widely understood. We're now like 12 years later and so much has happened in the area and there's many people at the university doing a lot of things, which is great, which was our vision. So that's my main job at the moment is, is working there with Cheryl with lots of different programs coming out of that. But it was a university community collaboration. Where does knowledge come from? Who contributes to knowledge? Uh, that was kind of our, our vision. <laughs> so that's us and if, if uh, Cheryl if Cheryl joins us, you'll be lucky. Um, so usually when I talk to audiences that are not identified as families or formerly incarcerated folks, I ask, I say to people, you don't have to raise your hands if you've been in prison. You don't have to raise your hands if you have a child in prison or someone you love. And you don't have to raise your hands if your child or your grandchild could have gone to prison but you got them a good lawyer. And you don't have to raise your hands if you have relatives who are in Narcotics Anonymous. And you don't have to raise your hands, but you need to recognize that we're gonna introduce you to a group of women that you might think are very far from your lives, um, but you're gonna meet a group of women who are just much more ensnared in systems that have betrayed them and in the carceral state. So when their children are picked up with drugs, they don't just get a fancy lawyer to get them off. When they're involved in uh, illegal financial activity, they don't as easily get off. So we're gonna introduce you to a complicated group of people and to a system that many of us have unfortunately um, treated as though it's over there and not associated with our lives. I'm lucky that 30 years ago, I was at CUNY, maybe I was still at University of Pennsylvania and I got a call from a mutual friend of Kathy's and mine, Bill Ayers, who said, my friend Kathy Boudin's up at Bedford Hills and she wants to get a PhD. Um, you think you could help her out? And I was, of course I knew who Kathy was and I was excited to get to know Kathy. And we started working together um, as friends. And I visited the prison a few times since like 1993. And within a few months, uh, President Bill Clinton had signed something called the Violent Crime Act, which removed Pell Grants from prison. And you all might not know, but in 1993, there were 350 college programs in prisons in our country. And in 1994, that number dropped to eight. So with the sign, uh, the signing of that law, the Pell Grants dried up and the college programs dried up. And within Bedford Hills, Again, I can't see you, so I don't know how many of you have walked through those bars, have been searched as you went in. 
have watched children and families demeaned upon entering, have shivered in a visiting room, have watched people being treated in the most degrading ways. But I'll assume that most of you don't have these memories. But in 1994, behind bars, a group of women, Kathy, Judy, Cheryl, and many others, mobilized and said, we've got to bring college back. College was the lifeline in the prison. College was the oxygen. College was the reason that women entered the GED program, the ABE program, the English as a second language program. It was the light at the end of the tunnel. It was a community, it was a family, it was an intellectual on-ramp. Um, and the women in the inside said, we've got to bring together advocates who can help us launch a college program. And so it was with the leadership of these women, a clause I will say often this evening, that college was resurrected. Little did I know they had already resurrected, uh, created a whole set of um, peer-led programs. It was interesting to hear that your learning project is a peer-led program because they started a, a violence, an anti-violence program, a mothering program, a puppies program. Judy worked in the infant center where women were permitted to uh, remain with their children till they got to 18 months. So this was already a space of great leadership by women on the inside. That is not a story those of us on the outside know. So I was lucky enough to be invited in. Within a few months, um, uh, with the amazing magic of, of fabulous women, the f these folks inside, and then someone named Regina Perugi, a CUNY hero, um, but at the time she was president at Marymount Manhattan College, Regina stood up and said, let's bring college back. Let's create a consortium. Let's bring together a consortium of universities. Each university dedicates one or two faculty, will create a curriculum around sociology, um, and I'll grant the degree. And I thought, who is this woman? This is this badass, beautiful, gutsy, college president. She later, hopefully she's on the call. She later became the president of Kingsborough Community College, but she's a woman who understands that education is at the soul of all things good, of the radical possibilities of reimagining oneself and one's community. So we, they, we, with the, um, approval of Elaine Lord, who was then the superintendent, um, college was resurrected within, I think, six months. It was something crazy. And I remember being at one of those early meetings and college had just shut down and you were all saying, it's just so depressing without college. And there was a correction officer walking around who said, not only is it depressing, when there's college, they study at night. When there's no college, they're fighting. They're biting each other. I don't know, he said something absurd. Um, but he was in fact acknowledging the power of college. Um, so college was resurrected. And then within a very short period of time, the women, and again, when I say the women, I mean, Kathy and Judy and Aisha and, and Pam and Donna and Cheryl um, said, we've got to document the impact of college because we can no longer take it for granted, right? That college had been in the prison for a long time. People just thought it was kind of part of an entitlement program. Um, and it was at their urging um, that they said, we, we need to document this. And I was honored to be asked to do the evaluation. And I come out of a tradition of what's called liberation psychology or participatory research which simply means no research on us without us. So that the people who most understand injustice should be part of the research team. And we've done that in schools and prisons and communities. 
So I said, why don't we do this as a PAR project, as a participatory action research project? And so we did. Um, two of my then doctoral students, Rosemary Roberts and Melissa Rivera, taught a course inside the prison on research methods. 15 women signed up. I think Kathy remembers it as more than that. Um, and we started with a mother question. The mother question was, what difference does it make to have college in prison? And each woman crafted her own question under that and then interviewed five other folks. So the questions were, what's the impact of college on women who were Jehovah's Witnesses and thought this was their fate? What's the impact of women who went to a terrible high school? Um, what's the impact of women who have lived under the thumb of violence all their lives from their mothers and then from their male partners? I remember that was um, Iris Bowen's question was, what does it mean to see one's intellectual signature when you've endured violence all your life? One woman studied What's it mean to go to college when you think of yourself as a lesbian and suddenly find out there's feminist studies and queer studies when you just thought you were the unusual girl in the neighborhood? What's the impact of college on our children? What's the impact of college on our, um, our visions of a life that could be otherwise? So by the end of this course, we had 15 times five interviews. Of course, the women couldn't record these interviews because tape recorders were considered contraband. So after that course, we then said, how many of you would like to be part of a research team? We'll do this together. And seven women from that class emerged as co-researchers and seven of us from outside. And we met in the beginning um, every other week we met for four years inside the prison, inside this little space called College Bound. And I naively thought that's what prison was. Until someone would say, my parents are supposed to come this past weekend, but the guard said, we lost your paperwork again. Until someone would say, my daughter was supposed to visit, but they didn't let her in because her hair was braided. Until someone would say, I was supposed to have a kidney removed, um, but I couldn't get to the hospital until someone would say, um, my son was incarcerated in the room, but still. So in that community, I thank you both because I got to see the kind of strength and brilliance and community that you all created within hell. Over four years, we did a research project. Um, we generated a very complicated method. Um, we interviewed women in the program, women who started the program. We interviewed their children. We interviewed correction officers. We interviewed 20 women who had been released, who had been through the college program. We interviewed faculty who taught in it. We also wrote to the New York State Department of Corrections and asked them to do a quantitative study of um, recidivism rates for women who had been through college compared to women who had not. So controlling for incoming level of education and crime, we found that women who went to college while in prison had about a 7% recidivism rate after three years and women who had not had about a 30% recidivism rate. We then started saying that even conservative Republicans should think this is a good idea. We met with the Black and Latino Caucus in the State Assembly and they said, Michelle, my colleagues are not gonna care that this is good for the women or even good for their children. You're going to have to demonstrate that it that there's a cost benefit analysis and they're not going to commit crimes after that. So we did a cost benefit analysis with the help of Michael Jacobson. And of course, we discovered that it would save the state hundreds of thousands of dollars to educate people rather than to reincarcerate them. Maria Torrey, my colleague, 
interviewed 20 women on the outside who had been through the college program. And she said to them starkly, how do you explain these recidivism data? I mean, on the one hand on your record, it says serve time for murder. And on the other hand, it says you have a BA. What accounts for you staying out of prison? And they would talk about the power of education to rewrite a biography, to think about the past and to reimagine the future, to understand structures. Yeah, thank you. To understand structures, but also responsibility. What did it mean to be responsible for the actions one committed in the past, but also for building a future? We created this report, you can find it online. We'll give you the link at the end, it's called Changing Minds. Just stop for a moment. I just have to say, so we wrote this report and I brought in, a, and you can see there are all of our names. Um, you know, some of us in green, some of us incarcerated, some of us not, most of us out. I think on this list, it's only Pam Smart who remains in, is that right? Mm. Yeah. Um, so this is a quantitative, qualitative piece of science collectively researched, analyzed, and published by a participatory research team of, at that point, incarcerated and, form and not incarcerated women. I brought in a friend who was a graphic designer who um, designed the first draft of the cover, roll back to the cover, yeah. So we knew it was gonna be called Changing Minds. It's kind of like changing your minds, changing their minds. But he had painted this very like stark white with black bars. And the women were like, oh, it's so dreary. Make it sexy, add lipstick, let them know we're alive, we're funny, we're loving. Yes, it's hell, but we are building community and family. So we got a much more beautiful cover. And in the volume, as you'll see, if you download it, um, inside there are pictures, there are little like motion pictures of women's lives changing. There are letters, get tough on crime, educate men and women in prison. There are quotes from corrections officers. Um, I hate this program. I, I wish I could get college for myself, but I know they're not coming back. And I know that, um, that there aren't gonna be discipline problems. And I know they're not coming back after education. And one of the initiatives that the women created was why don't we try to offer some courses for correction officers and for their kids. And then in the middle of doing this work, Eve Ensler had a big gala at um, Lincoln Center where a number of famous actresses performed the stories of many of the women who were associated with this work. Um, and at that gala, again, this was the brilliance of the women inside, we decided to give a scholarship to the child of a woman in prison, to the child of the victim of a woman in prison, and to the child of a correction officer. Because they, of course, knew that all of those lives were sutured together. So that's how we met 30 years ago. Since then, we had visited each other in prison. Since then, lots of the authors of this report came to my mother's funeral. Since then, we have had parties. We have gone to see Diana Ross, and we have done lots of continued research together. As Judy suggested, we're currently involved in a project, and then I'm going to pass to you, Judy. We're currently involved in a project. You could take that away, and people can download it. Um, we're currently involved in a project called the Survivor Justice Project. Uh, in 2019, a law was passed, again, led by the wisdom of formerly and presently incarcerated women who are criminalized survivors of domestic violence. That is, women who had experienced domestic violence, then engaged in some criminal activity that was associated with their experience of coercion and violence, this law creates an opening for women and men who can demonstrate that they were experiencing domestic violence when they committed their crime to potentially have either their sentence reduced if it's new 
or their sentence reconsidered if they'd been in for a while. When Kate Mogulescu, the lawyer who's been working on these cases, came to me and said, we've got to document this. I said, again, we need to do this with a collective of formerly incarcerated women. So we have the Survivors Justice Project, which is, I think, 11 formerly incarcerated women, two lawyers, a social worker, myself, and Maria Torre. We work on cases, we advocate, we meet with um, advocacy groups in other states, really trying to articulate the impact of domestic violence, which is kind of an easy ramp into prison for women, particularly poor women, particularly women of color. Um, we are contending with very thorny questions because you have to have two pieces of evidence to get your case, your, your sentence reconsidered who has access to evidence is actually a complicated question. Many women of color do not call the police, even if they're experiencing domestic violence for fear that someone will be killed or their children will be taken away. Women, white, black, Latinx, who are married to police officers who are getting beaten, don't call the police. So these crucial pieces of evidence are often lacking for reasons that are again, raced and classed. At, at our last session, we had a big and hard conversation about a current controversy with the women at uh, Rikers Island. Judy noted the 13th person on Rikers to have died from COVID. You've all heard that 230 some odd of those women are gonna be shipped up to Bedford Hills. In some ways that's a victory to, to close Rose Singer. In other ways, that's devastating. These are women who are women and trans folks who were there awaiting trial and are now being sent to a state facility, far from home, far from services, far from community. These are terrible choices. And I have to say, as a woman who has not been incarcerated, as a researcher lucky enough to be doing research with friends on the inside and out, I have learned so much about the racial class state violence of incarceration, the depth of knowledge and wisdom of women on the inside, the significance of having formerly incarcerated and incarcerated folks at the forefront of research and the power of enduring friendships over three decades. So I'm gonna turn it over to Judy Clark, who's just gonna give us a snapshot of the workshop, work she's been engaged in, and then we'll hear from Kathy, and then you all will have lots of time for questions. Thanks. Go ahead, Judy. Thank you. Um, just to say a little bit about my experience and in work inside, um, First of all, I want to say that I was, I, I went to college in prison. Um, I had had a year of college before I was thrown out back in the 69 um, for political activities and uh, had never gone back. Um, and when I got to Bedford in 1983, there was a uh, Mercy College was running a college program based in um, Tap and Pell grants, and um, I was facing a you know a life sentence. Basically, I had a sentence of seventy five years to life, and uh, really going through a pretty torturous uh, struggle to try to come to terms with having left my daughter of a year old and having um, sort of still believing in my righteous politics and actions and at the same time more and more having to question the choices I had made and um and what was I going to do to try to put the pieces of my life back together in new ways and um and in that period college was incredibly important to me I um I always remember a class that I took that was philosophy of the social sciences, where um, a professor, we were discussing, you know, is there free will? And the professor said, um, 
we do have free will. We don't have the free will to define our circumstances, but we have the free will to decide our attitude toward our circumstances. And that really became kind of my guidepost to what to do and how to live my life while I was in there and how to resurrect my life and myself in a certain way. So um, I certainly knew the value of college. Um, and I, I, was, I, I went on and got a, a master's degree in an independent program. And the, the, when I was, um, and during that period, um, I, um, when I did my master's degree, I, uh, I, we had, uh, Kathy and I had been involved in building a, a program um, to address the AIDS crisis inside um, called ACE. And um, it, was, it, it was the beginning of us creating a model where we said that the model was for people to be able to, to address the problems, the personal and individual problems we faced through recognizing our communal facing, that, that the problems we experienced as individuals were also communal problems and that therefore the steps we needed to take to try to address those problems was to build community. And that in doing that, we were establishing a different relationship to each other and to our communities on the outside and to our own sense of identity. Um, and that that brought a very diverse group of us together from, and it's a little odd, Kathy and I usually are, ra are rarely on these kind of panels, just the two of us, because um, you have before you three white women with fairly similar backgrounds. And I think one of the principles that we had in organizing all the groups that percolated all the programs we did inside was to always bring together women that would, that represented the diversity racially, but also in terms of like those who were the intellectuals and those who were the people that hung in the in the in the in the yard and women that identify you know that were in trouble and women that were not in trouble. We always tried to bring together a, a sense that we, if you were going to make something meaningful, then it had to include everyone and then had to value everyone. Um, so I have to say when we. This particular conversation does not quite reflect that. But um, uh, while we did a lot of successful work, we went, we went through a lot of periods of, of uh, repression as well. Michelle told the whole story of our work um, in, on, on this research and didn't say that at the very moment when we were concluding the research, um, they were, they were um, basically barred from coming in back into the prison. And um, Kathy and I were put in lock, <laughs> basically from meeting together and doing the work we'd been doing for, for, for three years. And that had happened before. And it happened to me at an earlier period. Um, and Cheryl was sent to the Canadian border. Right. Yes, there is a lot of sadism in prison. Right. So, so um, um, from when I was sort of feeling very, uh, marginalized and not, you know, not being being allowed to work um, in in the areas that I wanted to work, and uh, and having been actually taken out of work that I was doing, um, the research I began to do research um, on the experience of mothers, particularly new mothers who had very young children when we. Um, when we faced, when we committed our crimes and faced long sentences. And, um, and that, and I produced a, a, a study called the impact of the prison environment on mothers and their children. And I, I think that I just learned something about the power of research. I mean, first of all, I did it, um, you know, I wasn't allowed to do it. I did it, I was a participant observer. Um, I used Bettelheim as my basis. You know, Bettelheim said that he tried to maintain his, his identity as a researcher when he was in the camps because it was his way of maintaining his own sense of self. And for me, that identity really helped me um, both feel connected to 
what mattered to me in the environment, but also allowed me to have a third eye with which to look at myself, look at my experience, look at my child um, and share all of that. Um, and all the women that participated in that study um, were really in a certain way co-researchers in that study. So I think that all of those experiences like the college research we did really helped us understand um, that we were always trying to um, look at and understand things in order to make changes in ourselves and in our communities and hopefully in the power structure. Um, I, I, since I've been out, I mean, I got out 10 months before COVID. <laughs> it wasn't exactly what I expected to come out to. Um, but I think that it's been a period of time. I mean, it also meant that it was 10 months before the uprising of Black Lives Matter. And I think that that summer of Black Lives Matter was critical in, in really uh, synthesizing and giving a context to a lot of, I mean, I was doing very day-to-day -day work um, in, when I'm in, uh, at Our Children. I greet the women who are coming out after me and who are just trying to get themselves together and figure out how to utilize a program um, and that has rules and, and in which they have to sort of start to imagine new lives, but also go through all the steps of what that means and face enormous obstacles. Um, for myself, when I came out, uh, I came out, I was 69 years old because I had done such a long time in prison. I did not have, uh, and all the years that I worked inside did not count for social security. So I won't be eligible for social security or Medicare until I'm 74 years old. Um, issues of, of medical care are major, major problems for women. Um, women, even women after women get, get um, good jobs and look for housing. Um, women can't find housing because landlords do credit checks. And the first thing that comes up in your credit check is, is your, um, your record. And so um, one of the, one of the um, campaigns that I'm involved in is called the um, Fair Housing Campaign. And it's, um, we're trying to push for a, um, a city law that's before the city council at, as we speak, that would make it illegal to bar someone from being able to, um, to um, rent a house, rent an apartment because they have a record. Um, but all of those, all of those issues, you know, I, I sort of saw them close up. I've been interviewing women about their experience. And I say that the other thing that women talk an enormous amount about is that, um, that women went into prison oftentimes because of crimes that did relate to issues and experiences of trauma. And then all of our years inside only served to increase that trauma um, in all sorts of ways. And, um, and so the question of how to create healing communities for ourselves when we come out is, is critical and also difficult under the conditions in which people are trying to, you know, fight to regain their relationship to their children and find new jobs and learn how to use technology and all sorts of issues that make it difficult to do that. And one of the things that I think many of us from inside have found is that, um, that we find purpose and focus and almost a sense of relief in trying to do work that brings others home, you know that, and I think that 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 includes the Survivors Justice Project. It includes the work that Kathy began to talk, talk about, which is to look at the um, the the fact that in that a third of the population in New York State prisons are over the age of fifty five, and that's because people are serving such long sentences. And that basically, while, it, while you may think that we eliminated the death penalty in New York State, in fact, we just made the death penalty death by incarceration. Um, that people do not get out, they're denied parole if they have violent crimes and, um, and many don't even have the chance at parole. And so we're trying to 
pass some laws that would um, open up the possibility of people um, being judged by the by who they've become over the years of their growth and evolution inside and not who they were when they committed their crimes. And that also people over the age of 55 get a chance to go to the board, um, no matter what their sentences were. Um, so um, that's that's one of the initiatives that, that I've been working on and that, um, that again, who who comes to those in that that struggle are both people who have been inside and also families of people that are inside because so much um, when we talk about how women are affected, we're we're affected by our own incarceration. We're affected by how our children are affected by our incarceration. We're also many of us are affected by our loved ones being inside, and so many of the the bulwark of of those who are fighting for the parole justice are actually women who are, have been doing the time with their men inside. Um, that's not always true for women who are inside, who oftentimes do not have that same kind of support from men, which is a whole other issue that we're that we're struggling with. So I think I think part of what we're trying to do, and what's interesting about this conversation, is that all these things happen. And every once in a while, there'll be newspaper articles about it, but essentially it feels like it's happening on another planet. When I was in prison, I felt like, you know, I had, I, I had all sorts of connections to the outside and I had a history from the outside, but in so many ways, you know, they, we, I, 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 I was part of a suit that won the right, uh, won the fact that they should not put mentally ill women in solitary confinement. So instead they built another program for them called the behavioral unit. And they housed them in the medical unit and they took what was a regular sort of enclosed yard and they tore it down and they built a cage. They built this enormous three story high cage in which all the women were in separate cages, wrecking on their own. And that's what they called in these tiny little cages. And, th and that's what they did. That, that was their solution to not putting mentally ill women in shoe. And I would say like, this is crazy. Do people not see what's happened? Like, can't, how can this happen? And it can happen because it's happening in an invisible world that's completely separate from, from you know, it's that, that serves, serves the uh, creating a, a false sense of security because somehow all of the social problems that lead to incarceration get dealt with by shoving the, the, the product of those problems somewhere where no one else has to think about it. Um, and so I think that these kinds of conversations are important because we have to break down that barrier, you know, and we have to say that, you know, that what, what that those lives inside and those people inside and those people getting out and those women who are um, trying to make change in their lives and for the lives of their children are our community, all of our community. Um, so with that, I think I'll stop. Thanks, Judy. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back around, but it's really useful to hear both the history, the joy, the struggle, and the current campaign you're involved in, because there are 120 people happy to like either donate money or time to all of that. That's, I think, what they signed up to do. So, um, Kathy. I'm trying to figure out kind of an integration of, you know, my own journey and issues that I'm involved with. Uh, I don't have a plan for exactly what I'm gonna talk about, so we'll see where it goes. Uh, you know, I entered prison after being a fugitive for 12 years. And so for me, and sometimes being a fugitive was, you know, other people were fugitives in the early 1970, 71, it seemed like there was kind of a large movement and you were kind of part of that and you could hitchhike and you could, you know, I don't know, a lot of different things were happening, but later as the war in Vietnam closed and as the uh, 
attacks on the Black Panther Party and the, the deaths kind of led there to be much less of a visible uh, Black movement, Black liberation movement. Uh, being underground was much more isolating. And by the time I was arrested in 1981, um, I had a son who was 14 months old. His father was arrested at the same time that I was. So sort of facing a decision that had led to us leaving our son without parents. And I think that for me initially was just, I don't know, just trying to grapple with what had I done? You know, why had I done this and what had I done? But I don't think I was really ready to, to face that. In a sense, I felt as if I needed to rebuild kind of rebuild myself on, on some foundation because the isolation of having been underground and, and all of that, what that meant for 12 years, just getting my own name back was kind of amazing. Um, and so I think my initial period at Bedford, when I finally got to Bedford after two and a half years of pre-trial stuff, which was also had a lot of isolation in it. Um, I think relating to people in prison and feeling some connection with people and and doing things was really critical for me and, and my own feeling of self. And, um, you know, those initial years at Bedford included many things. Uh, I did a lot of sports. I was on, a, I was on a, the softball team, you know, and I was on the softball team for 20 years at Bedford. And we played teams that came in from the outside and we had practices and we built intramurals with, with women that were not necessarily, were not on the state team. And, you know, it built a whole set of relationships with women that I might not have had this relationship with, which was just kind of being a jock, you know, and uh, really enjoying it. And then, you know, did a master's degree in, in, inspired by Freire and uh, tried that out, you know, and um, I think a key piece of, what I did during those earlier years was working on building the uh, uh, building a, a, a way to deal with the AIDS crisis where you have one out of every five women coming into the prison that are HIV positive and there's no uh, one out of every five women. And we're not even talking about the women that are home that are part of their families and the women that are inside that haven't taken the test um, themselves to find out whether or not they have, <laughs> I mean, the fear, the stigma, it, it was, a divided, scared community. And I think we figured out a way, uh, and Judy gave some of the details to build a community that could take care of itself. And it was extraordinary. And it was documented in a book that we all wrote called Breaking the Walls of Silence, AIDS and Women in a Maximum Security Prison. But I think it was an example of um, a model that we were able to reproduce and you know, there were certain people working in the prison, a woman named Sister Elaine, who really led the development of a lot of parenting programs. But each of these programs, even though they had different roots, um, understood that the women themselves addressing their own what are individual problems also had, I know Judy said this, but I'm just gonna repeat it because uh, the individual problems had social connections, solutions, sharing. And it was that connection of, of people being able to feel that they could do something <laughs> and they could do something that would help them and they could do something that would help others uh, was kind of a model that, that developed. And it's funny because, you know, at a certain point I said, you know, Kathy, you got to really deal with what got you into prison. And I think that it took, you know, it took, took a, my being in bed for, for maybe four or five, six years before I began to feel solid enough in myself to begin to say, I have to, I have to, I have to look at what led me here. <laughs> you know, why did this happen? Why did I make the choices I made? And you know, that that became a journey in itself. And I think that as the years went by, there's a number of things that I felt. One was that those of us who had ended up in prison and had led to the harm of other people, the deaths, the harm, in <laughs> We had the long sentences, we were considered long-termers, and we were constantly turned down by the parole board. And it's sort of just the people that were the leaders in the prison were being turned down by the parole board, which you could imagine robbed other people of any hope, let alone the families and the people themselves. And so the parole issue and why are people being turned down became for me a central 
central issue, that there was the parole system was based on what we ultimately began to call the paradigm of punishment. And this had to be dealt with. The other part of it is that when people come into prison, they work with their lawyers, which is part of the adversarial system, to minimize what their role is in whatever happened. I mean, that's the whole system is, how do you come how create a narrative in which you have less responsibility and therefore can get a better plea bargain or a better verdict at a trial? It minimizes what you did. And so you go through 10, 20 years of prison without actually either talking about what you did or acknowledging the harm that you caused. <laughs> it's, it's the system is designed in a certain way around punishment and lack of people feeling res responsible or being able to deal with it or come to terms with it. And so, you know, I was fortunate to be in a writing group uh, in which I think quite a, a lot of this began to emerge. But when I came home, I had two burning things that I wanted to do in, in addition to working with the teenagers of uh, mothers that were still in prison to work on helping them go to college, which was to build some sort of a program inside in which people had the space to look at why had they done what they did and can they tell what they really did? <laughs> you know, and that meant working with people who had been in for 15 years, were past their appeals and felt like, ah, I'm ready. I'm ready to talk about it. And we built a program called the Long Termers Responsibility Program or the Coming to Terms Program. And I think it was a way of saying, we have accountability that we have to figure out how to talk about that we have to develop. It's not coming from the state, but it's gonna come from a circle of us doing that work together. And at the same time, we have to take on the parole system. And that's kind of what led me to be part of creating RAP is to, how do we overcome the dehumanization of people in prison? You know, the initial concept was, well, let's think of people in prison as elders who have been there for a long time or grandparents, you know, as an as a, as a in to kind of overcoming the total dehumanization. And that, that movement has grown tremendously in the last, uh, the last several years, and it's really exciting. There's a new generation of people that are really leading it. And, um, you know, I think we have some hope that these bills that Judy described may actually pass. But I think that grappling with both those issues, the parole system that is based on permanent punishment and the sentencing and the long sentences on the one hand, and then on the other hand, what does accountability mean? You know, when you've harmed somebody and how do you deal with that? And how do we deal with that as a society? So that's been pretty important to me in terms of the centrality of my work. Um, I think that, I guess for me as well, the whole issue of being a parent and being a mother in prison and knowing that you can't reverse what you did, <laughs> but you have to figure out how to move forward with it. And I think that, you know, the ongoing conversations that have happened over the years, with my son, you know, my asking him, well, how come you don't call me mom? You know, because he was raised, he was became, we became part of another family. He's still part of my family and his father's family, David, but we're part of a larger integrated family. And he grew up where the mom that was there, as he said to me when he was 11, you know, mom means you call the person, you need help, you know, and you weren't there. And so grappling with those hard discussions for years and years, and in a sense, they never end. And I've, my son just had a grandson, I just had a son, so I'm a, I'm a grandmother now, which is kind of grapple with it. And I think like, what will it be like for all of us when that child turns 14 months old, which is when I got arrested, and how much that moment will take all of us back again to try to grapple with how could that have happened? How come we did this? <laughs> I mean, look at this 14 month old, you know? And so I feel like it's a lifelong process and it's not one that mainly is grim. It's not like that, it's just part of this process. And I think that, um, I think the other thing about being home for me is feeling that the community of women is, is a critical community. And, uh, you know, when I do the work, with rap and, and, and parole justice. Well, there's a lot more men in prison, you know? And I think certainly involving the women whose 
whose loved ones and family members are in prison makes a big difference, but there's still a kind of uh, gender aspect to this that is dominant. And I think the work I'm, I'm doing a lot involve a lot of projects that relate to women. And I really feel that there is a culture of community and relationships that exists among women in prison and exists when they come home, when we come home. That's a really important thing to build on and that it can make a difference for men and women. And so the focus on women for me is not just about what can benefit women, but it's about understanding that kind of what we are able to build ourselves can impact on men and impact on the world. And I think that I've sort of gone through a new phase of, of feminism in a certain sense you know, in these years since I've been home. Uh, I, I don't know how much to describe. I mean, um, I, I don't know whether this is a time to stop and give people a chance to ask questions or whether I should describe more of the work. I, I, I don't know, Michelle, you have a better overview of this. I can describe a couple of the projects that we're doing. Uh, I don't know. I think it would be great for you to describe. I, I just want to underscore some points you've both made. And, and I appreciate, maybe because we're talking to people who are our age. Yeah. It feels like a different conversation than we've ever had together, which is a kind of journey through. I mean, you've both recently become grandmothers. <laughs> Certainly to so, children, yes. To children where you weren't physically present all the time after they were a year, year and a half. And, and it's been very beautiful to watch that in both of your lives. Um, but also you're involved in big political projects and, and intimate projects with women. And part of what's beautiful about the work that each of you do is that you understand it's like a structural issue and an intimate issue that that we fix people and we fix each other but we also have to transform policies so kathy if you could give a sense of some of the movements that i think um or campaigns there are 120 people listening um who really might want to get involved with stuff and and want to understand what are the active campaigns and kathy once you do that then judy and then at a quarter after, let's open to questions. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. sure. Well, I think that the, the, the parole justice campaign, which is now focused on partly getting these two bills passed that Judy described, the elder parole bill and the fair and timely parole bill. And they're both, they need each other in a sense because if you have parole boards that are turning people down based on the idea that it's okay to continue to keep people in prison because of the nature of the crime that they committed 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, you have to change. You know, and the law that guides the parole decision-making has been very difficult to change. So the fair and timely parole bill makes some changes around that and I think could make a big difference. But of course, elder parole lets an entire group of people be able to have access to go to a parole board when their nature of their, the, of their sentence is that they would die in prison. So they wouldn't make it to the parole board. So I think those bills are really important. We also have work that's being done around a clemency, clemency campaign work, as some of you might have known. Uh, Cuomo gave clemency this year to 10 people, which was in itself kind of amazing, but there were not a single woman that he gave clemency to. He has done it in the past, given some clemencies to women, but this year to give 10 clemencies and not give a single one to women, you know, it, it just, it was amazing. And I think that we're hoping is that, you know, with Governor Hochul in place for at least a little bit of time that we can make a difference around the number of clemencies in general and, and the folk, and folk focus on women as well. And finally, we're working on trying to change the parole board. And it's very difficult to figure out how to do it. You know, we can have a longer discussion about it, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And anyway, so that's another part of the work. So the bills, the parole board, the clemency, these are all things that we're working on. Um, and certainly there was a lot of work mobilization done around making sure that when COVID hit, that women in prison felt that there were people <clears throat> that cared about them, that tried to get them some supplies, tried to get them care packages. And it mattered to feel that, that people matter and people are caring about you. So that's one whole area of work. I'm part of a, um, 
kind of a broad national organization that's called the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And what's one of the things that was their original goal was to end incarceration for women and girls. And although they've been considered kind of outrageous at times and they've gone to certain funders and you're crazy, in reality, being able to have a vision that we don't need prisons for women and girls and figuring out how that how you talk about that in relationship to men is is another is an issue but i think that if you look at the, the new england states there's 100 people in one state in in a, in a prison there's 130 people in another prison and then you're talking about building new prisons and putting money into new prisons and as opposed to imagining what would case management look like or maybe women some women have to be incapacitated you know, in, an, in a place where there is a restriction from being outside it, but does it have to be the dehumanization and making clear that people know that they're bad people and that they, any rehabilitation has to come from above them. It doesn't come from within them and with among them. So I think that being able to have a vision that imagines a situation without prisons, I think that we can imagine that. And it's good to imagine that. And I think being involved with them, as well as more locally beyond Rosie's campaign, are, are really important pieces of what we can do right now. And it's not imaginary and it's not an abstract abolition because it's not like just like, oh, let everybody out. That's not the issue. It's like, how can we create something that's actually really quite different? And you work with it with a small number to start with. So I think that that's really been important. And I'm in an international commission and we're working with women in Latin America and women in uh, Uganda and women in Kenya and women in Sierra Leone and women in Indonesia and the National Council and Argentina. And I think that having a sense of how much commonality there is with women around the world dealing with incarceration has been really educating, educational for me. And sometimes the emphasis may be on the drugs and what that's done to their lives and their need for survival. But there's also, there's a lot in common, I would say, and that's been really exciting. And Cheryl and I have a couple of major projects and one of which is uh, we're doing an oral history of the uh, women's effort to bring higher education back to Bedford. And we're, we're doing a website, we're interviewing people. Um, obviously Michelle and Judy are part of that. Um, and all the women, all the women that were part of the original collective there are part of it. And uh, what, what, the reason we're doing it is because we want to elevate the fact that although people mainly know about men who have done amazing you know, struggles to change the system, there's not as much knowledge about women. And so we're doing it as a way of creating a, a, a case study, in, essentially, of one example, and then as a way of encouraging other universities, colleges, research institutes to work with women who are in prison or women who have come home to document what, what women have done to challenge the conditions of mass incarceration. And the second project is called the Collective Leadership Institute, where we uh, have an institute for one year in which women from around the country are part of it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not just Chicago, California, and New York, it's, it's actually Louisiana, and it's Texas, and it's uh, the state of Washington, and it's uh, Mississippi and Alabama. And we have 20 women that participate in this and are part of a collective learning to strengthen their organizing, which they're already doing when they do it. So we're in the middle of our third cohort right now. And uh, so we have to do it virtually, but maybe by next year, we won't have to do it virtually. So these are just examples of projects. Oh. There's a million things that one can do. And these are some of them. So, Judy, why don't you just give us some of the current campaigns? And then if you could both, if you're willing to put your professional emails in the chat in case I think people have follow-up questions. Judy, go ahead. And then we're gonna to open to um, Q&A, Mariel. Um, um, I, well, let me just say, I mean, just in terms of the particulars of um, the work at Our Children, it's really about, it's, it's really at the level of service provision. But one of the things that we've been able to do in this last period is that there is a push um, to, um, to provide alternatives to um, detention. And we have the beginnings of 
a couple of the DAs in New York, um, particularly the, the, actually the Brooklyn DA, who have been sending women to our children instead of, you know, who are facing very serious um, um, charges, but whose cases, you know, reflect some of what we've been talking about, especially in terms of domestic violence and youth. Um, and, uh, and, and what we discover is, I mean, that by virtue of them being out um, fighting their cases or addressing their cases and successfully, you know, utilizing the resources of our children to basically do well, um, you know, three years down the line, they end up, you know, basically diverting their cases so that instead of spending the next 15 years in, 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 in prison, they're, they're able to reunite with their children and move on with their own. And, and the fact that that's happening and almost has to be kept secret because if it starts to be talked about, then there's gonna be pushback against it is kind of crazy, but it okay. is true. And that's true of like everything, you know, we fought to get a law passed in New York um, that, that um, to end solitary confinement because all the evidence shows that basically it's torture and it's destructive and it, it's if anything criminogenic. And um, as soon as that law got passed, um, there was a, a fight to that, oh no, we need it, we need it, we need it. So even when we win any of these battles, same thing with domestic violence, um, there's always a pushback and we have to be aware of that. We, we, we got very minimal bail reform and then they blamed all, every crime in, in New York City is blamed on bail reform, even though none of them have to do with bail reform and all of them have to do with, with COVID. And um, so there's a constant need to really try to um, exemplify the successes um, and push back on all of those. I, I, I guess there's a, um, I'll, I'll put my thing, but I think I, I, there is a list that I, I think that everyone's gonna be able to get. Yeah. So um, what, but, yeah, go ahead. So on that list is, um, is, is the Pearl Justice Project that we talked about. On that list also is something called the, the, um, the Justice Roadmap. And that's actually one of the exciting things that's happening is that groups that are doing individual, like, you know, there's people who are fighting for, like we're fighting for a, a law called the clean slate, which would basically mean that after a certain period of time outside, after you've been in prison, that your record can get wiped clean, because you, because which allows you to be able to move on in all sorts of significant ways so that we can begin to address the, you know, the, the, the problems with perpetual punishment. There's laws to, um, to try to challenge their use of, of horrendous, you know, uses of, of exorbitant fines and fees that basically impoverish families whose, whose loved ones are inside. Um, but there's an attempt now to sort of bring, there's laws that we're trying to fight for changes in, in youth justice. Um, so the, the justice roadmap is is a way in which all these different particular groupings fighting for each of these different things come together and say and in with mutual aid. So if you look on the on that website, you can you can <laughs> there's like a whole menu, and every one of them you can find uh, you can connect to individually. And 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 part of what you do, part of what the work is, is talking one on one to legislators. You know, I've spent last week talking one-on-one -on -one to council members about the fair housing bill and why it needs to get passed and, and, the, sol and the ending of solitary in Rikers because that's part of five of the 13 people who've been killed committed suicide. And I trust me, part of that is about solitary confinement. So, um, so that's another way that you can find out, you can sort of connect is through that particular site. Um, can you remind me what else I put on it? <laughs> Ariana, can we can we list those? And meanwhile, Marielle, can we go to the questions, or should I just read? Can you read the questions? I sure can. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Kathy, Judy, and Michelle, for sharing this important work and in, so inspiring, um, and your stories. So. Um, on the topic of the bills, and as Ariana pulls up the resource list, 
There's actually a question here about um, the specifics of the bills that you've talked about tonight yeah. to allow people to interact with the elected officials regarding the proposals. So I if think we could roll that in. This, but uh, I, I just put that in for all, I, I think that the, the, the website for all justice ny.com has fantastic sheets in it Thanks, that gets details. Uh, so that's the second uh, one here. Yeah, but so, I, I, yeah, well, I put two. I put one is parole justice and the other is rap, and they both have the details of all of it. I think parole justice may be even easier to get the information from. So I, I highly recommend that you look at, uh, it's called parole justice NY. I, it should be there under. Yep. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, I think that's the best. Yeah, that, yeah. that that has these one cheaters that really describe. Uh, I guess Judy has you have it on your list, Judy already. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 um, um, mm -hmm. okay. okay, great. Thank you for highlighting those. And I'm just pushing out comments as they come in. Um, I'm not reading them out loud, but please do see those shout outs that you you are both getting the thank yous. Sure. Um, there is one here that I, I think we should bring forward, which is from Cassandra Garrett, um, who is actually a uh, retired deputy warden from Rikers and doing research on really similar topics. Um, they write that participation is a huge factor in the success of a program. During my experience with prisoners, I found so many women were reluctant to participate in educational programs due to the many distractions. What motivated you to participate in the educational programs and how did you overcome the distractions that are often found in a correctional environment? I, I, I don't know. I mean, in my experience at Bedford, um, when people found a good fit and a good teacher and a good environment in the classroom, they were motivated to be um, in the classroom and to work hard. I, my first, my first um, year that I was at Bedford, I went to the graduation and we used to have graduations that was like everywhere from people who had started at ABE and went all the way to college. And I remember that year, a woman graduated from college, she was about to leave. And she talked about the fact that she started in the ABE class and she was leaving having graduated college. So, and I think that um, one of the things that motivated, you know, it's very hard if, you know, a lot of the women that come to prison come to prison because they have, um, they have learning disabilities that never got addressed. And then it turned into quote unquote behavioral problems. And then those, they got treated as behavior problems instead of with people with learning disabilities. And so when you come in, you know, so they've had, a, horrendous experience of education. And so the need to create educational programs inside that respect adult, the intelligence of adult learners and that engage them. And I think, you know, Kathy did great work um, in terms of, on terms of that, um, in terms of the work that she did with um, ABE learners. Um, and, and I think that the women in the college program, um, they, they struggle with each other. Like, hey, you didn't show up at something. You know, there's a there's a we we have a we have a learning center and we use it as a hub to really encourage us the social aspect of learning. I think that women, you know, are not going to sit in their cells independently and learn on tablets. They need that engagement with each other, and that that really makes an enormous difference in terms of people's motivation. And those graduations were just stunning, right? You would sit in a gym and it would be filled with women watching families and women would go across and their kids would run up and walk with them and they would have flowers and they would get hugged. And it was the most collective engagement. Like if one person graduated, we all graduated. It was so counter to the stereotypes 
that were circulating years ago about, you know, in some communities, people don't care about education. It was such a rich, but as Judy said, collective experience of joy and accomplishment and all boats rising. I just I want to answer, one. could you all answer the, the first question by Cassandra Garrett? Um, the women from Rikers who would end up at Bedford would not be eligible for the college program. Is that right? No, they probably will be able to go to the college program. I mean, nothing is understood about what the situation is going to be. It's pure chaos at this point. Um, at this point, women are mostly concerned. They are pre-trial detainees who are going to be separated from all the resources that they've been able to you know, have connection to. To, in their efforts to not just address their criminal cases, but also oftentimes their family cases, because most of them end up in family court because of their criminal cases. Um, and uh, that it's, uh, it's really been a, a pretty stunning situation for them. Um, um, and actually, I will say that um, a quarter of the population inside among the women have written a petition um, um, about, about it that uh, is very powerful. But, it, but our understanding is that they will be able to participate in the college classes if they are eligible for college. Can either of you answer the question that Carmen Mason's asking? Can you speak to the disparity between eventual release of black women and white women? Do we have parole or release data we certainly there's enormous disparities in who gets picked up who's arrested who goes to prison who goes to adult prison with black women have much higher representation um but do we know about release yeah i mean there was an article in the new york times in december two years ago that said that release rates were definitely lower for black women and the albany times union this year and i don't know the date of it had a more up-to-date of that. But I don't know the exact statistics, nor do I know the exact day that it happened, that they happened. But these are two articles that had done, that, that were reflected the research that was done around that. So I love that we have people from South Africa and I think Jamaica West Indies, Tracy, is that you? That's um, great. Uh, all I will say on Tracy's question, what were some of the ways you dealt with biases on the team, tensions between incarcerated researchers and non-incarcerated? Were there moments of sharing? Um, there was lots of joy. There was lots of contraband cookies. There were <laughs> tensions as there are in all research teams, but over four years, we were no longer like women in green and women not in green. We were no longer those who were going to get strip search when we left and those who were going to cry on the train. Some of us were mothers, some of us were very political, some of us had um, long illnesses, some of us were primarily Spanish speaking and those kind of webs across also developed. We never forgot who was, who was incarcerated and who was free to leave. But, but new kind of beautiful spider webs of connection emerged across us. And yes, there were, there were some um, moments. Um, there was a moment where Maria and I brought in the codes to analyze the interviews. And Judy said, oh, what, some version of what do we chop liver? Like <laughs> you do all the smart work and we just, we do all the grunt Quite work. The like, we want to develop the codes. And of course, Marie and I thought we were being generous and helpful um, because there was no place to keep all those interviews in a locked cabinet where they could access them and code them and analyze them. But then for six months, we sat with those, with those interviews and we read them together. And um, there was another moment where we were writing up the section on who is the we, and we each wrote stuff and then read each other's. And I wrote something 
you know, too poetic and overdone. And it was like, we're all women and we all care about structural violence and police violence and um, racial violence and intimate violence. And we're all committed to education. And somebody said, Michelle, you left out the part that some of us killed our kids. And if you don't add the part that we think about it every day, that we're, as Kathy and Judy have both said, that we rethink the crime and who we were and how we were capable. Be honest about the complexity. It doesn't mean that we should be thrown away forever. But some of us did harm. And in fact, we feel deeply responsible for that. Um, so there were beautiful, tense, gorgeous moments together. For me, I have to say it was the best research because rather than doing research with people just like me who think like me, we brought together our differences as a resource for really um, what some would call strong objectivity. And I would say it just makes the research better when it's led by the people who most understand injustice and you create a community of um, dignity and respect for what's called epistemic justice. Um, that, that, that we all bring knowledge to these questions and those who have paid the biggest price and have been most discredited, in fact, bring the most, the sharpest line of vision. Judy, Kathy, do you want a, a last word? I, I know that we're over time and we still have, we're down to 99. Yeah. 21 people went to bed. We did pretty well. Kathy, Judy, last thoughts. I wish that we had more time to uh, interact with the questions that were asked or the comments that were made. So yeah. I, I feel like it's been, I feel like it's been a good conversation. <laughs> so. And I'll end with sort of that thought about um, harm, um, because I do think that uh, the question of finding different roads to justice, real justice, is so critical. And the fact that our carceral system is completely rooted in racism. And at the same time that um, that we, we need other alternative restorative ways of addressing it. And that one of the things that folks who've done a long time, you know, for serious crimes represent is a resource because we're a planet that is in peril because of the harm we're, you know, the society is doing in a large scale. And, and we're a society that has, is grappling with historic harm. And so sort of saying that recognizing harm is not, this, is not a, a, does not have to be a dehumanization, that it can actually be an opening to repair you know, inside, outside, in the environment, vis-a-vis -vis racism, you know, all of that becomes so important, so important to all of us. And in that spirit, I thank you, Marielle and Phyllis and Susan and Ariana for creating space. We hope you have been unmasked and that you put your mask back on. I hope your biases have been a mess. I'm glad we could take you to a place where maybe you've never been, but where a deeply inequitable, racist, classist society sends our problem to be dressed in the, in the cages that, that Judy described. And I think both Kathy and Judy are asking us to imagine what would a society look like? How would we build safety if we weren't hyper-reliant on police and prisons? How would we build safety if we didn't have kind of a racialized lens that allows us to treat large groups of people of color as though they are not human? And so I can't think of a better place than the CUNY Graduate Center to be thinking those questions Great. aloud. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And those resources will be made available through the survey, so please do um, give us your thoughts on tonight's program and mark your calendars for our next talk in this series um, on December 6th. It's a Monday 
at 4 p.m. that time um, with Professor Van Tran, who will speak about Asian Amer American discrimination and class bias. So thank you so much for uh, being with us tonight and to Judy, Kathy, and Michelle for being so generous. Thanks. Have a good, have a well, good night. Be well all, be safe. Bye.